Have you ever heard anything about the rise of crime in the 20th century? And what about lead? Or about crime increase because of lead? Now you may be thinking, God damn it, it probably has something to do with bullets. No, my friend, things are much more interesting. If lead enters the body at a young age, certainly not by being shot in the back, but as vapor, then later on a person may become aggressive and capable of acting inadequately. There is nothing to do about it. It's a very powerful substance that affects the nervous system. The fact that you could get a little nervous and shoot somebody with your shotgun is not the worst thing that could be caused by lead. Just imagine that for decades, mankind has been inhaling that crap and it has been accumulating in the environment. What a coincidence, the crime wave occurred right around that time. Once this stuff is dealt with and acted upon, there were also fewer crimes. What do you think of such a match? Come on, that's not fiction. That correlation was discovered by bright professors. You can Google it if you want. Have you already faced the biggest question? Yes, that question. Where the hell did the lead come from? I mean, everything was fine, everybody was happy, and suddenly, here we are. And why did it increase so much that it started to affect people? Keep watching and you might be very surprised at how a series of events and a few decisions almost led to a worldwide catastrophe. Let's get started. Now let's go back to the 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States. So before the light bulb and the electric grid appeared everywhere in the country, we remember that kerosene was used as fuel for lighting. Well, it had another competitor, ethanol or simply alcohol. And at the best of time, its production even reached 25 million gallons a year. However, competing with the oil industry is a lost cause, as we know. Whether it was a coincidence or our old fellow Standard Oil had a hand in it, the alcohol production became taxable. As a result, the development of the alcohol industry was slowed down and the volume of alcohol production decreased. Now, let's talk a little about cars. What does it have to do with cars? Well, just a moment and you'll get everything. As we already know, at the end of the 19th century in the United States, cars powered by internal combustion engines stepped onto the scene timidly, or rather, drove out. Those were not the engines that smoked steam all around and demanded water. They were the very real ancestors of modern engines. At the beginning of the 20th century, automobile production in the United States continued to grow even faster. Now here's another curious fact. These first internal combustion engines were designed primarily to run on alcohol. That's right, once the alcohol tax was abolished in 1906, ethanol was actively used as a fuel for automobiles. You had to buy two bottles of bourbon for yourself and for your iron horse. Surely gasoline kicked in the door and broke into the automobile industry, but all that happened after. In the meantime, even Henry Ford's brainchild, the Model T, and other cars produced back then were originally designed to run on alcohol fuel. That's right, our genius Henry Ford hoped that a flammable and boozy liquid made from corn, for example, would be the main fuel for automobiles. Well, who knows what he was hoping for, but it didn't work out that way. It was the drunk farmer's fault. A drunken salesman, too. A drunken conductor, a drunken factory worker, and even a drunken policeman. In short, everyone in the United States in the early 20th century was drunk, or almost everybody. Indeed, without exaggeration, it was turning into the great scourge of American society. People in the U.S. at the time were massively drinking alcohol with or without any reason. Anyway, some part of society got worried that they wouldn't have enough alcohol. Well, just kidding, they got seriously worried. Many people started to realize the dangers of mass alcohol consumption. A number of anti-alcohol societies were formed. As a rule, these were religious authorities and women's associations, which led to the so-called anti-saloon movement. Bourbon and other hard liquor opponents tore their throats out in squares and streets, pressuring the government to ban all this fun, and finally, their voices were heard. On December 17, 1917, Congress passed the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The basic meaning was, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of liquor within the country was prohibited. This also applied to the importation of alcohol from other countries. Thus began His Majesty's Prohibition. We could tell a whole great story about that time, how prohibition was broken within an hour of its passage, how criminal elements became rich, how Canada profited from the whole affair, how sly pharmacists prescribed medicinal whiskey at extra cost, and other interesting facts, but that's not what interests us. Well, assholes, how should cars be fueled now? The 18th Amendment just ended the possibility of using ethanol as fuel. By that time, there had been a lot of cars all around. Should people fuel up at illegal liquor stores run by bootlegger gangsters? So then they'll ask you, why did you go to jail? And you'll say, for half a tank of fuel. Well, that's a shitty scenario. But wait, we have oil. People have learned to make a lot of things out of it, including gasoline. Back then, cars could also be fueled with gasoline. 
It became the only real alternative in the existing situation, but it wasn't all that simple. There were some problems with gasoline, too. Both gasoline and alcohol actually existed at the same time. So why did the creators of automobiles prefer ethanol-based fuel over gasoline? Because there was a chance to get drunk in the garage right out of the fuel tank? Of course not. Alcohol burned cleaner, it didn't cause a lot of emissions, and most importantly, the engines ran much smoother and better on ethanol. Why? Well, let's try to figure that out. In simple words, if the fuel was of poor quality, it was very bad for internal combustion engines. The answer lies partly in the name of the engine, internal combustion, meaning that something burns on the inside and it is somehow ignited. Things are like that. I hope you have at least a small idea of what an engine is. Its main component is the cylinder, inside which the piston goes up and down. It looks somewhat like a medical syringe, but in the syringe, the piston goes all the way to the top, while in the engine, the piston doesn't go all the way up, leaving a little space in the cylinder above the piston. The remaining space is intended for the combustion of fuel, being the combustion chamber. Once the fuel burns, it creates pressure, which pushes the piston down and it transfers energy from the crankshaft to the wheels, which spin and we can successfully drive wherever we want to go. Now, this is just a very simplified explanation, but we're not at university or anything and no need to go over everything in detail. So when the piston goes up, it compresses fuel until it rises completely to the top position, where the spark flashes in the combustion chamber with the spark plug and boom, the piston goes down. Then it goes up. Same thing happens all over again and so on. And there is one important thing. The more we compress the fuel before giving it the spark, the more energy we get and the more power we can squeeze out of the engine. And alcohol was perfect for this purpose. But gasoline could blow up during compression before the piston reached the upper point. Just like that. I'm going to explode since you're pushing me. That is much earlier than necessary. It turns out that the explosion occurred ahead of time and pushed the piston down while it was still going up. Well, that sounds like bullshit and a bullshit that was killing the engine. That was called detonation, and the property of fuel to resist detonation is measured by the octane number. I think we've made things clear. The numbers you see at gas stations, such as 87, 89, or 93, are the octane number. And the higher the number is, the more fuel can be compressed without threat of detonation. Back then, the octane rating of gasoline was around 50, which is very low. So you need to figure out what kind of gasoline to put in your car so as not to kill your engine. Open the tank hatch for sure, it's all written there. The octane number of alcohol was just perfect for the engines, but outside, it was goddamn prohibition. It was necessary to do something about the gasoline, otherwise there would have been too many orders for the service stations. A bunch of people got together, including oil men, car manufacturers, and chemists, and they tried to figure out what to do. I wish they hadn't even started. So here's what we have. Gasoline ruins engines, but you can't use alcohol because it's outlawed. Cars need to run on something that doesn't destroy them. One gets used to the good stuff quickly, and it's hard to imagine the U.S. economy of that time without cars. Moreover, there were rumors that oil might run out. Anyway, the atmosphere was nervous, like waiting in line at the venereal disease doctor's office. In such a stressful environment, two bright inventive minds were working on that problem under the roof of the research division of General Motors Corporation established in 1919. Chemist Thomas Midgley and his boss, engineer Charles Franklin Kettering. Charles Kettering invented a lot of useful things for different purposes. He was the one who introduced electrical equipment into the car, lights, ignition, and most importantly, he invented the electric starter. Before that, cars were started with a crooked handle, which could bounce off and kill the hapless motorist, which happened quite often. Anyway, Kettering proved to be a great guy. Thomas Midgley was also a brilliant inventor. Not as great as Kettering, of course, but still, mankind will not forget him either. For example, he invented Freon, a gas for refrigerators that nearly destroyed the ozone layer of the planet when Freon production reached its peak. In fact, if you study Midgley's life more closely, you can see how skillfully he created things that were dangerous to mankind. He was like Thanos in the science world, as if he wanted to exterminate half the population. Nevertheless, he won a lot of awards and patented many inventions. General Motors, jointly with Standard Oil of New Jersey, assigned Kettering and Midgley the difficult task of inventing a gasoline supplement to produce fuel with a high octane rating and patenting it to make it economically profitable. Such fuel supplements were called additives. The command is given, the command must be fulfilled, and here we go. Midgley started his research. Like Mr. Heisenberg from Breaking Bad, he stayed in the lab day and night. For a long time, the experiments didn't lead to any results. An interesting fact is that Midgley even tried to create alcohol production from oil, so that the oil industry could also run the ethanol business. 
but he didn't achieve much success in that. A lot of time, energy, and money was wasted. As a result, Thomas Midgley started tearing the hair out in desperation, trying to add anything he can to the gasoline. Virgin's blood, paint, Coca-Cola, oddly enough, and that didn't work either. And then he reached the toxic substances. On December 9, 1921, he added lead to the gasoline. And oh gods, the engine started running. No detonation. Midgley rushed to Kettering like lightning and told his boss that the Philosopher's Stone had been found. It was the lead, but he cautioned that it was a little bit noxious, or not a little bit. But who cares about harmfulness when engines keep breaking down? The market wanted a solution, and the companies wanted money. Now, here appears to be an option, the production of which would not be difficult or expensive since there was plenty of lead in nature. The main thing is that it could be patented so as to make enormous profits. Midgley had not yet had time to shut down his engine for testing, while GM and Standard Oil managers were already calculating how much revenue they would get from the additive. Of course, this was presented to the chemical company with the right dressing, everyone was praising Midgley and Kettering, so to speak, and it was a great success. The additive was not pure lead, it was called tetraethyl lead, or TEL. This compound was discovered as early as 1853 by Carl Jacob Levick, professor of chemistry at the University of Zurich. It was a mixture of ethyl chloride, lead, and sodium, but that didn't change the point. Just imagine, something containing lead was about to be added to the tanks. Obviously, nothing good could come out of the exhaust pipe. Still, since people already had some superficial understanding that lead was something rather disturbing, it was decided to emphasize ethyl in the name in order to make it more appealing to the public. General Motors and Standard Oil didn't hesitate long, creating the Ethyl Gasoline Corporation in 1923 and setting up TEL production, asking for help from the more experienced guys at DuPont, the more mass-produced chemistry company. Oh crap, I remember using toilet water labeled DuPont. I wonder if my hair will fall out before my time. Well, come what may. A lark's a lark, but in the U.S. there was a large production of a rather dubious gasoline additive, the effects of which on humans you will soon find out. Well, happy birthday, leaded gasoline. At first, the following events were like the theater of the absurd. Thomas Midgley, while dealing with Tell, got poisoned and even took a leave of absence in January 1923 to improve his health. Earlier, alarming letters expressing concern about the tell use have been sent from scientific colleagues and the Public Health Service to General Motors, but they were swatted away as pesky flies. Finally, on February 1st, the first commercial sale of leaded gasoline took place at Dayton, Ohio. Hooray! The tell production had started to develop. No medical tests had been done, none at all, in fact. Soon, Midgley was awarded a medal for the discovery of the anti-detonation effect of tetraethyl leaded gasoline. However, he didn't come for the award because he was taking a break from his brainchild, lying on the beaches of Miami. That same year, 1923, were the first warning signs. Two employees died due to lead poisoning at the Dayton plant and many of the employees experienced extremely strange symptoms, such as hallucinations, unsteady gait, and mental disturbances. Most of them would become disabled, and some would end up in an insane asylum for the rest of their lives. Then at the other plants of the Ethel Corporation, the story repeats. There were more deaths, people were going crazy, basically some kind of a mess was going on. An internal inspection revealed that the workers had simply failed to follow safety precautions. Brilliant explanation. Put your gloves on and you'll be fine, keep working. Tell isn't going to spill itself all over the tanks. More and more people were criticizing everything about Tell, but Ethel didn't care. They don't even hesitate to advertise their products. Their brilliant marketing experts whipped up slogans like, As an Ethel user, you benefit from significantly increased speed and greater power, faster acceleration, and complete elimination of detonation. Ethylated gasoline has made it possible. Take a ride with Ethel in a high compression engine and experience lifelong thrills. As for the lifelong feeling, they make a good point. By the way, have you seen the word lead here? Hmm, where did that go? Still, Ethel adopted some measures. First, they paid more attention to safety in the factories. They built and improved ventilation systems, issued protective clothing, trained people, and so on. Secondly, seeing that a government-level showdown was about to begin, these sly guys made a pretty good move. 
realizing that their own research on the tell's dangers would have little credibility, they said, okay, we need to do more research on the effects of tell on the human body. Let's get some outside organization involved for more fair evaluation. And for this purpose, they involved an organization that seemed to be third party, but almost friendly to them. As weird as it may sound, this organization was the U.S. Bureau of Mines. That wasn't all. Our clever tell owners agreed with the Bureau on the remarkable provision that the Bureau would refrain from publishing progress reports in the press since newspapers tend to give scare headlines and false impressions. This was 100 level impudence. So the issue seemed to be investigated, people seemed to be taken care of, safety measures were introduced, and all those things seemed to be so conscious. In the meantime, tell had been successfully distributed to the fuel tanks of U.S. cars, money had been deposited, and lead fumes had been blown all over the ethyl plants and dispersed by the wind across the continent. However, sooner or later, all secrets come out. And after another mass poisoning at one of the corporation's plants in 1924, the management had to deal seriously with the press. There were five deaths in a very short period of time, and a total of 80% of the staff was affected many people had very serious problems. The news of those deaths was the first that Americans heard from the newspapers about the harms of leaded gasoline. The news was delayed too because the management of the company did not make any comment at first. Finally, the press was invited to the Standard Oil headquarters in New York. Thomas Midgley was urgently brought there to explain the situation on his part, and on top of that, the company said that there had been an accident, a sudden release of tell vapors. In other words, force majeure. Anyway, the guys tried everything they could to get out of the situation. But then, Midgley's performance in front of the press turned to be a real showpiece. Midgley had just regained his health after being poisoned by his own additive, but he decided to demonstrate the safety of Tell to everyone. He washed his hands in Tell, breathed its vapors for a while, and then dried himself with a handkerchief. Well, thank you, Thomas, for not drinking the stuff. One way or another, all these tricks did not help much, and the society started getting angry while the newspapers kept reporting incidents at the ethyl factories. But the most important thing was that people continued to suffer, and in 1925, the production of Tell was restricted by the New Jersey authorities. However, just a year later, a special committee appointed to investigate the incidents concluded that there was no valid reason to ban the sale of ethyl gasoline. The committee found that all reported fatalities and serious injuries occurred either in the Tell production process or during the blending procedures, they said. In short, the conclusions are as follows, quote, workers involved in production can get poisoned if they're not careful, but for everyone else, Tell seems to be harmless, end quote. After such a favorable report for Ethel, the faucets were reopened and Tell appeared in the gas stations once again. Still, the same committee added, quote, right now it's not clear how the population is affected by Tell, so we need to investigate it further just to be on the safe side. However, this story went nowhere no one wanted to take the expense of any observations and experiments. And that's when Robert Kehoe appeared on the scene of the debate about the harms of tell to humans. Charles Kettering hired Kehoe to fix up the production and create rules for handling tell. Kehoe was very agile, clever, and sly. In 1925, he was already the chief medical consultant of the Ethel Corporation, defending the version that the use of tell and gasoline was safe. Soon enough, he would become kind of an influential figure in the industry and the healthcare system. Although his reputation would be severely compromised, but we'll get to that later. This rascal decided to protect the company from any attacks regarding the damage caused by Tell. Since he had already realized that no one had investigated anything and would hardly want to, he decided to do the research himself. He made good use of the situation. He found that a certain level of lead in the body was quite normal. God only knows how he determined that level. Finally, he added, if anyone gets strong evidence that our product is really toxic, we'll pack our bags and stop producing Tell. The sad thing is that it was not just about ethyl, but about leaded gasoline in general. Since the patent was expired, the production of the additive started to actively expand geographically, moving to other countries. In fact, there were only his values to indicate fixed norms for lead concentration in the body, figures based on his own biased research. Nobody seems to be worried except some cases where people go crazy, but well, that doesn't mean it was caused by the lead, right? Meanwhile, the tell distribution reached significant levels. In 1936, the additive was in 90% of gasoline in the U.S. Well, that's the way things turned out. The company had almost closed down, but ended up taking over the market. How? How is it possible that people didn't want to pay proper attention to their health? They just went along with some guy from a company that manufactures a dubious additive. But not everyone agreed. Do you think there are too many bad guys in our tell story? 
way too many, right? However, by the rules of the genre and universal equilibrium, wherever there's a villain, there's always a hero too. And he showed up. Among the cornfields and farms of Iowa, on June 2nd, 1922, Claire Patterson was born. Sound familiar? It's exactly the same Superman story, but Patterson didn't have any superpowers. Instead, he was a very stubborn man with a keen intellect. Patterson devoted himself to science, more specifically geochemistry. That's the science of the chemical composition of the Earth, something like geology but at an advanced level. And during World War II, Uncle Sam asked Patterson and a whole group of scientists to play with uranium and create some kind of explosive contraption. They succeeded and developed the atomic bomb. However, after the first use in Japan, Patterson was horrified by what they had created, so he switched to the peaceful application of his talents. He didn't want to be the bad guy. Perhaps he felt guilty before mankind, therefore, trying to work on useful projects. But let's pretend you want to know how old is our planet. Well, you Google this question and see that the age of our Mother Earth is 4.54 billion years old. So that age was calculated by Claire Patterson. He succeeded due to the phenomenon of radioactive decay. It seems that I need to clarify what sort of trick this is. It's more complicated than the example of the piston and cylinder. Let's imagine a substance. It consists of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms and inside an atom there's a nucleus. There are substances in which the atoms are acting turbulently. They emit different particles or whatever. In general, they behave actively and unstably. This activity is called radioactive decay. And the trick is that during this decay, after a certain period of time, one substance that decays will gradually form another substance. What do you think uranium turns into when it decays? Well, that turns into lead. And if you know the decay time of uranium, then by the ratio of uranium to lead in any sample, you can understand how old the sample is. But how did the scientists figure it out? To understand this ratio, all these atoms and molecules should somehow be weighed. Mass spectral analysis was used to do that. Well, that's a real mind blow. I suggest that instead of torturing yourself, you just understand that Patterson got some kind of scale on which he could weigh uranium and lead molecules and compare to their volumes. Thus, Patterson decided to take a piece of meteorite, which was supposedly the same age as the Earth, and examine the ratio of uranium and lead in it, comparing it with the decay of time and getting the age of the Earth. I wonder where you can go and get a piece of a meteorite like that. Is there some kind of meteorite fair for scientists? Well, either way, he succeeded, doing a great job, but during the process he faced a very strange phenomenon. When he started to figure out how much lead was in the first meteorite sample, he got over-the-top values. There was clearly more lead than there should have been. Patterson decided that it was due to some previous experiments, after which the sample or the equipment had been poorly cleaned. As a result, he created sterile conditions and brought the research to an end. However, something triggered him, so he decided to revisit the issue of lead content and the surrounding environment. He was surprised to see that even in samples where there should be no lead at all, the amount of lead was off the charts. Patterson realized that he was living in the age of lead, found in cans, pipes, glass, paint, and so on, but he also realized that the largest amount of lead is probably contained in leaded tell gasoline. Of course, he also realized that there are no high-quality studies on the issue. There weren't any studies? Well, there will be. So Patterson plunged headlong into his work. He rushed around the world and collected samples from various places, from the ocean depths and water surface, from the ground and air in different parts of the world. He even went so far as to study ancient mummies to compare the lead saturation of the bones of modern man and the man who lived many years ago. From time to time, he had already drawn concrete conclusions and published the first reports in national newspapers on the harms of leaded gasoline. Meanwhile, tell had been successfully used for a whole three decades. Once something has become a part of life, it's hard to believe that it can be extremely harmful. On top of that, Kehoe was calming everyone down by mocking Patterson's conclusions. Back then, Kehoe was already an influential figure. In short, Patterson's first studies were taken lightly. Do you think he gave up? Hell no! Despite the tons of bullshit he was exposed to, he persisted in his search for facts and evidence. Finally, he reached some horrifying conclusions. The concentration of lead in the atmosphere of the Earth is a thousand times higher than its natural content. A thousand times, and the content of lead in the human body is probably exceeded by a hundred times. Kehoe spewed something like, what geologists can understand about biology, in response to such loud statements. Not to mention that in 1965, the Society of Toxicologists also ridiculed Patterson's article, timing it as science fiction. Yet Patterson didn't care at all. The dogs bark, but the caravan goes on. If that's not enough for you, fine. 
Patterson went first to Greenland and then to the South Pole and got ice samples from different depths, comparing them layer by layer with the samples taken on the surface. The result was, samples showed a 300-fold increase in lead levels from the 1700s to the current date, but the sharpest spike happened in the last 30 years. The increase occurred precisely during the period of mass distribution of tell. What more proof do you need? It's all man's fault. In parallel, there was accumulating medical evidence that exposure to low levels of lead, well below keyhole levels, could be harmful to children, reducing their mental capacity later in life. Later, the connection between lead and an increase in crime would also be explored, as lead made it a person aggressive by affecting the nervous system. Society started to wake up. Patterson devoted a huge part of his life to proving there was a huge mistake that should be resolved immediately. Finally, for the first time, he was listened to, and in 1976, Kehoe's conclusions about lead standards and human exposure were declared nonsense. Next, the manufacturers of leaded gasoline were ordered to reduce the lead content of their gasoline. It was only in the 1980s that Patterson research data was truly recognized. The final point in the use of tell in the United States was reached on December 31st, 1995. Patterson didn't live long enough to see his greatest triumph. We should never forget his hard and diligent work to save humanity. It is a rare case when the whole world should know this man. Instead, there is almost no one who knows him. Kettering, Midgley, Kehoe, GM Management, DuPont, Ethel, Standard Oil, what have you done? This whole series of events and decisions is a terrible example of greed, human ignorance, abuse of authority, and most importantly, the devaluation of human life. It was not without fatal consequences. In any case, such examples should remind us of what the lust for power, domination, and enrichment can lead to.